Before we kick off with this week's episode of the Brendan O'Neill Show, I'd just like to take a second to tell you about Spiked Supporters. Spiked Supporters is our thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked Supporter and get access to a number of exciting perks. Spike supporters can comment on articles, get free and discounted tickets to events, get a discount on all items in our shop, and bookmark articles as you browse. This is all our way of saying thank you to all of you who fund our work. Everything Spike does is free, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere can read us. We're really grateful for that. If you don't give to Spike yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spike supporters account. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. While it presents itself as progressive, critical race theory just perpetuates the cliches of late 19th century of white is normal and whatever is not white is exotic and fascinating and has to be looked at with care and cautiousness but we should not be allowed to talk about it lightly it only enforces this idea that difference is bad so while it pretends that it acts in the name of equality it just nurtures the prejudice that there is a norm and whatever does not belong in this norm has to be treated differently Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Marie Cather Daouda. Marie is a lecturer in French at Oriel College, Oxford, where she teaches both French literature and language. She studied French and English literature at the Sorbonne. She has written extensively on issues relating to authorship, creative writing, and the influence of the Bible on literature. Marie has also become a voice of reason over the past couple of years on the statues debate, including the controversy over the statue of Cecil Rhodes at her own college in Oxford. She is an insightful critic of identity politics, critical race theory, and the so-called decolonization movement on campus. So Marie, I want to start off by asking you about Edward Colston, and uh, specifically about the recent acquittal of the Colston Four, the four people who were charged with criminal damage for tearing down the statue of Edward Colston in Bristol. And it seems to me that this case possibly sends a bit of a green light to people to tear down statues of people like Edward Colston or people who had links to the slave trade. Of course, jury decisions like this one don't set a legal precedent, but this does seem to have set a bit of a moral precedent, or it seems to have fed into a pre-existing moral obsession with statues, with historical representations, and with history itself. So I want to start this discussion by asking you how you felt about the acquittal of the Colston Four, and what you think this case tells us about our attitude towards statues today. Well, I think it's not really a matter of feelings, is it? I think, well, this country has laws and these laws have been breached. The statue was a grade two listed public monument and there are precise regulations about what, how these, these monuments ought to be treated. So when the Corson Four were acquitted, I was rather intrigued by what happened, what had been said during the trial. And one of the things that struck me was one of the uh, pressure points that was used, namely that the, the jury was asked to be on the right side of history. So all of a sudden, the trial shifted from judging four people who damaged a public monument to judging a figure of 17th century slave trade. So now this leads to looking looking a bit closer to Colston. We have now labelled him as a slave trader. His involvement with the Royal African Company would in fact be closer to what we would 
consider nowadays as shareholding. Mm. And even though he also had private ships that were involved in slave trading as well, um, he was far from being the only one involved in such trafficking. It was something that was not considered all right in his time as well, but the Royal African Company was a property of the king and people like the philosopher John Locke also were involved in it. So now it does happen that in Bristol, in that particular context of 2020, his statue gained visibility and the focus shifted from the material presence of this statue to what he could represent. Mm. So when the jury acquitted the Causton Four, it wasn't so much a reaction to what they did as a reaction to modern sensitivity towards something that was entirely part of uh, the British history. So one thing that I found fascinating too about the history of Bristol as a major port that was quite capital in the economic development of England was that, well, the 11th century Bishop of Worcester, St. Wolfston, also fought against slave trade around Bristol. But at that time, in the 11th century, we were talking about slaves that were imported from Ireland. Mm. So I guess what surprised me about the trial was that instead of calling for a deeper historical awareness, the jury got guilt-tripped or guilt-trapped into expressing a judgment on a statue and on a man. So it's also rather reminiscent of these posthumous trials that mm. will constitute some of the gruesome parts of history. I don't think there is much dignity about it, and I'm not sure it gives credit to this country's actual enormous effort in acknowledging its responsibility in slave trading and in things that well would nowadays be considered as not positive in the the image of the country and the way its current citizens would feel what they, that they belong or do not belong to it. That's a very good outline, I think. And one thing that has struck me during this whole discussion is that any attempt to historicize this discussion or to broaden it out to look at the question of why statues why certain individuals and certain representations of history have become the focal point for so much fury and so much contestation. Any attempt to do that will often lead to very knee-jerk accusations. Well, you're pro-Colston, you're pro-slave trade, you don't really care about the crimes of history. And this kind of very naive approach that is taken to um, serious political historical discussion. And in relation to that, I wanted to ask you about the particular role you think statues play in some activists' minds these days. So the one thing that really struck me about the Colston Four case was the way in which one of the defence's arguments was that this statue was considered to be a hate crime. It was deeply offensive to a multicultural city uh, in a multicultural city like Bristol. And there was al almost this argument that it will it would have harmed particularly black and ethnic minority people who had to walk past it on a daily basis. And it reminds me of other discussions about the Rhodes statue in Oxford, which I want to come on to as well, uh, and other statues which are now referred to almost as environmental microaggressions. So this idea that it's a, it might just look like a piece of stone to some people, but to others it really hurts them, it really damages them. What did you make of that argument that was put forward in the defence in this case and which is used more broadly in other discussions too? Well, there is a lot to unpack in what you said. So first, there is this question of, uh, well, the fact that we are now judging a person using very different standards. So the Colston mm. statue is very emblematic of this Victorian era art that was supposed to commemorate benefactors. And nowadays, if anyone says, well, first, that the statue was meant to commemorate 
cost and generosity towards the city of Bristol. It is understood as, oh, so you mean Colston was only a good person? Yeah. And then people yeah. jump from this conclusion to the fact that his statue was celebratory of his action as a slave trader. I think we should really distinguish these different elements. So first, uh, the Victorian era was the, the benefactors era. Many people from upper middle class or upper class would find a social standing by contributing to their city and by, well, partaking in a sort of, well, exchange of wealth. They own wealth, regardless of how they did it. It's as though, well, I, I think nowadays someone who makes a lot of money having Amazon or HSBC shares would be in the same position of having money people couldn't really look into and then using it for something positive. So Colston built almshouses, orphanages, schools, etc. And it is understandable that a hundred years later, the people of Bristol looking at his legacy would think, well, he represents something that we would like to see going on, namely people wanting to contribute to their city's welfare, which is something quite positive. So there is that on one side. And then there is this problem of, well, how we would look at the statue nowadays and jump from, well, this is the statue of someone who made money through slave trade to this statue is an aggression that could not take any position in, well, that could not be looked at without feeling offended uh, by anyone living in modern Bristol. The problem with this assumption is that it somehow forces an emotional response where an ethical reaction would be enough. So, of course, people could look at the statue and think, well, Corson did some horrible things. He also did some good things. And history f is full of people who did very good things and very bad things. And I think none of us can stand and say, well, I've only done good things in my life. So now this assumption that the presence of this statue is harmful First, well, I think it's a bit naive, and then there is something rather racist in assuming mm. that it would be harmful to a certain category of people because of their skin color, because of where they're coming from, or because of their current position within a multicultural society. So I think it's wonderful that Bristol is so multicultural, but we have to be careful about how we use this sense of multiculturalism. I was reading the... Uh, testimonies of the Corson Four, and one of them said that what she liked about Bristol was the fact that it was multicultural and had different restaurants and lots of food from all around the world. So yes, sure, but well, I'm Moroccan, I'd be offended if you saw me as a couscous. So there is so much more <laughs> to multiculturalism than, oh, well, these people are exotic and they eat spicy food and they dress in a fancy way and they would speak with interesting accents. So in a way, this fetishization of people of ethnic minorities is counterproductive insofar first as, it, uh, as it, it, it stigmatizes people, making them look and feel weaker than they are. So just because you're coming from a foreign country doesn't mean that you cannot live in another country and look at its heritage with a certain form of distance. It doesn't mean that everything has to be condoned, of course, but it just means that we can move on and we can appreciate the fact that with everything that has happened, Britain is probably the, the country that has done the most in terms of racial equality, in terms of fighting slavery at an international level. So using ethnic minorities in order to create this sort of useless division between people of different skin colours or washing the white guilt off from people's well past, I, I'm not sure it really fits this purpose of creating an actually peaceful multicultural society. I think this is achieved m much more clearly when we can look at this difficult heritage, walk around it, discuss the, sta the statue's artistic value, discuss what these or other people did, what it actually meant in a specific historical context, and then. Well, if people are unhappy about it, they can definitely criticize it, write about it, take whatever legal actions, but not 
attack public monuments in such a way because it's it's just not what cohabitating means. I also couldn't help but notice the the racial dynamic in the Colston Four case. So what we had here, I don't want to pick on the four people themselves, but what we had in the Colston Four were four white people who's and one of their core arguments or one of the core arguments of their defense team was that part of the reason they tore down this statue is because they presumed it was a, a hate crime against people of ethnic minority backgrounds, that it would cause them harm, cause them damage, as you've just described there, that kind of rather uh, racially paternalistic idea that certain people need to be protected from historical representations. And without getting into those four individuals themselves, but the broader argument there, which is a worryingly common one these days, this notion that it falls upon largely privileged, very often white activists to create the conditions in which ethnic minority people feel more comfortable, feel more safe, feel happier in their surroundings and in their community. What do you think that aspect of the Colston case tells us about contemporary anti-racism and the possibility that it's lost its way a little bit? Well, I think it raises a very interesting uh, set of questions, first with the vocabulary that is used. I'm sure you're familiar with the term ally. So (laughs) if you're a good ally, it means you're white, but you are aware that black people are underrepresented, are victims, or whatever. I'm pretty sure people from ethnic minorities would resent being limited to this stereotype of being the weaker one. So behind this idea of recreating social justice between people of different races and cultures, we find the same pattern of the white educated savior telling racial minorities who ought to know better clearly that, well, there is this part of the Western heritage that is actually harmful to them and therefore to protect them, we are going to remove it. So this raises first this difficult question of, well, shall we forego on the Western heritage because Mm -hmm. of immigrants? I think that's the last things, uh, it's the last thing immigrants would want because it just taps into this nauseating cliche of well immigrants not being able to adapt and adjust in a new setting and people who have fought hard to make it and to achieve some sort of success in places where it is possible like in great britain would resent being limited to just being this poor victim who needs to be helped by illuminated white savior who has finally realized that he or she has been so bad for so many generations is now washing his or her hands clean of this guilty past. So when we look at the dynamics of the cost and statue case, I wouldn't say that, well, the uh, dynamics are strictly emblematic of that because when you look at the pictures, it's hard to tell that, well, there were only white people involved Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. that black people were not participating. Somehow that's not the problem. What I find more concerning is the fact that the police did not act. Mm -hmm. And that one of the things that was brought forward during the trial was that as no one stopped them, they did not presume they were doing anything illegal. So this raises a question of, well, cultural awareness, not towards different cultures, but towards one's own city and laws and regulations. So the problem is that when the officers who ought to be enforcing these laws are just bystanders and approve of this destruction of public monuments by doing nothing, the image it sends is that this can be done in total impunity, provided there is a good moral justification for that. And this goes to, well, this echoes a, a very deep problem that we have in our society nowadays, which is that if the motive is good, anything is allowed. And this bypasses the rule of law and goes against all the benefits of having an actually rather accurate legal system that is meant to protect everyone. It's not just meant to protect statues. If you start considering that anything linked to white supremacy 
between inverted commas has to be destroyed, then where would we draw the limits? How far could we go in destruction of public property, private property, aggressing people, harassing people? Where, where could we draw the boundary? So that to me would be the uh, main problem with the outcome of the trial. If you've tried and failed to get healthier, there's no point beating yourself up about it. Strict diets and exercise routines often start off fine, but they're hard to keep up. If you're looking for serious long-term results, then you need to try Noom. Instead of forcing you to make radical changes or getting you to follow impossibly strict rules, Noom helps you understand your mind and body so that you can develop new habits and make changes that last. You only need to spend 10 minutes a day on Noom to feel the difference. It's taught me that it is okay to have off days and there's no such thing as bad food. The Noom app gives you access to loads of different recipes for inspiration and it also makes it easy and fun to log what food you've eaten and to see your progress. It is so easy to integrate Noom into everyday life. It really takes the stress out of living healthier. Noom is completely tailored to your needs, your goals, and your personality. For those of you who like to crunch numbers, Noom can give you some incredibly detailed insights into your health, or you can get the motivation you need from speaking to the Noom coaching team who are on hand to lend their support and advice. Don't just take it from me, more than 80% of Noom users finish their personalized program, and more than 60% end up sticking to their goals for more than a year. So lose the weight for good. Sign up for your trial at noom.com slash Brendan. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash Brendan. I want to ask you a few more questions about the new forms of anti-racism and white saviorism in a moment. But first, just to stick with the statues thing for a little bit longer, um, I want to ask you about the experience of the Roads Must Fall campaign uh, around your college in Oxford, or Oriel College, and um, a long-standing campaign to remove the statue of Cecil Rhodes, former colonialist, and so on. And I wrote some critical pieces about that campaign, and I've always been struck by the incongruous nature of incredibly privileged students at one of the highest seats of learning on earth who uh, seem to spend a great deal of their time obsessing over a fairly small statue on a building. And that's always struck me as very odd and and very telling about the culture we live in, where people are almost so desperate to have the victimhood status that they have to plunder history for proof of uh, the victimhood of their the generations that came before them and kind of adopt that as their own form of victimhood. And one thing that you said about this campaign that I thought was very interesting is that you said it was a a dazzling sign of Western privilege that people could devote so much of their moral energy to one small historical representation in a university that they were attending. So could you just explain a bit more how you saw the Roads Must Fall campaign and what kind of problems you think it was uh, expressed about the times we live in? Well, on these matters, I speak on a strictly personal capacity. So my views are not representative of Oriel College or of the University of Oxford. Um, but I, th- I think the first thing that has to be said in terms of contextualization about the road statue is that the only way it could hurt you is if you crook your neck trying to see where it actually is in the building. So it is uh, a four feet tall statue that is so high, it's actually hard to get an actual picture of it. So the, well, the Roads Must Fall movement started in South Africa in a very different context. I can't say anything about, well, how valid or invalid it is to uh, stand against road statue over there. But what I've noticed is how easily this copycat activism was transferred to the University of Oxford. And interestingly enough, how it focused on a visible emblem, a statue, while at the same time we have the Rhodes House, where Rhodes Fund is still being put at great use to provide funding to students from all around the world. So I think our modern times have probably something to sort out with the way they respond to visual elements like statues. It's, uh, well, uh, just as 
for the Corsten case, there is a conflagration between the statue and the person. So the way Roads Must Fall started uh, in Oxford uh, between 2015 and 2016 resulted in the college, well, saying that the, the statue should be contextualized, that there should be some effort into providing historical context, which has been done. Now, the trouble is that after George Floyd's murder, um, it, well, Roots Must Fall was rekindled specifically in Oxford, and the people who were originally involved in the, the first Roads Must Fall movement remained rather silent. And I'm not quite surprised because many of them were actually Rhodes scholars. So Rhodes, as a benefactor, did not just provide funds to Oriel in dire times. His legacy was actually meant to ensure what was the first colorblind scholarship and the first black student who benefited from it was Ellen Leroy Locke, who was one of the main ph philosophers who worked on this new Negro concept. And the purpose of this concept was to define black people not in relation to slavery, not in relation to having been brought up or whatever under white domination, but in having independence of thought, independence in artistic creation. So we're going quite backwards in comparison with what happened in the early 20th century when black students started affirming an identity that was meant to separate them from this victimhood that mm -hmm. people are now using as the only sign of validity that they could have. So now with this whole well, intersectional business that is going on, people try to score points of victimhood. So I would often say that what I can say, I can say it because I have African woman privilege. I have this possibility of saying what many white men could not say because they would just be bashed and told that they should check their white man privilege. So in a way, well, first thing about the presence of these statues is paradoxical because the very fact that they are here is, well, matches a historical period where Great Britain was developing at a very quick pace. And therefore, this luxury, this excess of wealth made it possible to have institutions that are now benefiting to everyone all around the world. So when we talk about this problem of Western privilege, we should also see how it applies to these protests. So protesting about the fact that there would be a road statue or a Corston statue would not be a priority in a country where there wouldn't be a relatively stable uh, political, educational, social system. It's a sort of intellectual luxury to be willing to erase one's past while other countries are struggling to gain a better acknowledgement of their historical past. So if this whole anti-racism business was more honest, they should probably try to um, get a better understanding of the pre-colonial situation instead of limiting the countries that happen to have been colonies to their status as post-colonial countries that are always defined as the victims of a, an empire or the victims of a conqueror. And how about in relation to what it tells us domestically as well? Because you've just outlined there very well, you know, the the ridiculousness in some ways of obsessing over such a small statue in such a privileged place and in a privileged country, globally speaking. But domestically, it, it tells us something about contemporary so-called progressive activism, doesn't it? Because what you have here, and you've commented on this before, you have a situation where campaigners are spending a huge amount of time and energy on this very small historical representation of a man and far less time, if any time at all, on continuing inequalities in contemporary Britain. So, for example, the fact that working class people are still less likely to get to Oxford, still less likely to go to some of those important, impressive institutions of learning. And so do you think that the statue stuff has become 
a distraction from the harder job of creating a, a fairer, more equal society? Or is it simply that this is the form that politic, so-called progressive politics takes now? It's very shallow. It's quite showy. It's about boosting one's sense of self rather than transforming society. How do you explain that disconnect between the, the fact that we still live in a society that has inequalities that ought to be discussed and tackled and the fact that supposed warriors for a fairer future are obsessing over a small statue at Oriel College in Oxford? Yes, indeed. So as, as you said, the, well, taking care of the troubles that the working class is facing at the moment should be a much higher priority. When we look at the Sewell report, for instance, it's clear that the ethnic minorities are actually doing well education-wise because most of the time they would come from families that value education and who still believe, uh, whether it is right or wrong, that an education can get you anywhere. And what I do believe in is that effort can lead anyone anywhere, regardless of, well, whatever labels one could put over any situation. So it is much harder for a working class boy to get into higher education because the mentality in the background would not be the right one. Because the, there is this sort of defeatist mentality that no, you, you are not going to make it. So instead of tackling this problem and offering more opportunities, this discourse of you're not going to make it is now extended and racialized. So on the fact that this is now the form that political activism takes, yes, indeed, I, I think we have a real problem of social media political activism, that people would care more about a flamboyant gesture like toppling a statue than creating a scholarship or founding a school that would provide a decent education from the early years to, uh, to, to secondary education. These are projects that take time, that take a lot of energy. It's a sort of, well, I, I think to see the output of founding a school, you would need to wait 15, 20 years to have it running properly. So toppling a statue is just a more convenient way because you can just do something uh, noisy and loud and have views on Twitter, TikTok or whatever. And all of a sudden you are seen and you are a hero. So people would say that once they gain this visibility, they would make something of it. I really doubt it because there is, well, I, I'd say it's not the same category of people who would uh, spend their time doing click activism or uh, yelling at statues and people who actually get their hands dirty working with children in need or providing help to families who are actually trying to make the best of whatever they can to get better and offer a better future for, for their children. Okay, I want to dig down a little bit more into the contemporary discussions about race and identity. And you mentioned your African woman privilege. And of course, we live in a society where increasingly people are defined by particular identities rather than by their sense of citizenship or their sense of belonging to a community or their sense of belonging to a to a country and i want to the first thing i want to ask in in relation to this issue is about the idea of institutional racism so one of the things so it's a kind of nice segue from the statute discussion to the racism discussion because one of the things that is said about oxford for example and i know you're speaking in a personal capacity here but one of the things that's said about oxford in following the roads controversy is that it is an institutionally racist university. You mentioned the Sewell report, the report produced by Tony Sewell for the government, which called into question some of the hysterical claims about Britain being an institutionally racist country, which is a term we hear uh, all the time from uh, progressive activists. How do you see that term institutional racism, this notion that it's racism is institutionalized and embedded in virtually every important institution in this country. How do you understand that, that, that idea? Maybe we could try putting huge signs saying, don't come to Britain. We have <laughs> institutional racism in Calais, for instance, and see how it works. Mm. I think this too is, uh, uh, well, a, a sign of privileged 
under the guise of self criticism mm -hmm. because to, well th this idea of institutional racism means that the institutions in and of themselves would not make room for women for underrepresented minorities for ethnic uh, ethnic minorities the thing is that i'm not sure uh, that this is the reality we see around us. The first thing that struck me, well, settling in Britain, moving away from France, is actually how many people who would not look ethnically British, whatever that means, are in high positions in different fields. So when we say that the university is uh, institutionally racist, the idea behind that would be, for instance, that it would be harder for a student coming from an ethnic minority to get admitted into the university, that it would be harder for a foreigner to get a teaching position in the university. This is absolutely not the case when, when you see how things go day by day in, in the university. And this is not due to the uh, whole anti-racist claims that many departments will feel the urge to put stating that we are an anti-racist community or we are committed to fighting racism. It is because there are actually people who are very good at what they, they, they do who actually apply to work in England because it's a wonderful place to uh, evolve in professionally. And um, having this narrative that no, you won't make it because you're a member of a minority mm. is creating much more damage than help. Because, well, obviously in, in the early 2000s, before the 2008 crisis, the narrative was you can get anywhere if you put in the effort, regardless of who you are, where you come from, just try your best, do your best, and things will happen. It might be a sort of rosy, sparkly tale, but I think at any rate, it's less damaging than having someone telling you from your youth, but you happen to be a black boy, so I'm sorry, you won't get into university, you won't do anything good in your life. So there is that, and there is also the lack of awareness of the economic realities behind this. So now we are focusing on racial privilege, for instance, but this prejudice that if you're a bit brown, it means you're poor is just plainly insulting because, well, uh, I'd say, well, students from ethnic minorities in different universities across Great Britain have a very different economic background and come from very different experiences. So you would have the uh, Kenyan multimillionaire uh, heiress landing her degree in Oxford, and yes, that's perfectly fine. And next to her, you would have another slightly brown student who got there through a scholarship and both would do extremely well during their exams if they put in the effort and won't do as well if they don't put in the effort. So now the trouble is that if we start making everything a matter of quotas to fight institutional racism, um, we, we will lose sight of personal merit. And I already wrote about that. I would hate to think that I got any position because I happen to be African. I like to believe that I am recognized because I would bring in some interesting information or some interesting teaching and that it is valuable. And not that I'm here to boost the quotas and make the university look more inclusive. I think you've outlined very well there the the potentially regressive and, and fatalistic consequences of constantly telling younger people in particular that this is an institutionally racist country, you'll never really make it, all the odds are stacked against you. I think sometimes contemporary so-called anti-racists don't recognize how damaging that message can be. And as you say, the other side of the coin, which is that everyone can make it if they put their mind to it, that might be a bit simplistic, but it's surely preferable to the idea that this kind of baleful argument that Britain is such a horrible and racist country that there's no hope for you. And it's it's very, I've always thought it was very contradictory that these are the same people who will campaign 
for more and more immigration, for higher levels of immigration. And I always think to myself, well, and I speak as someone who takes a very liberal approach to immigration, but I always think, well, why do you want more and more immigrants to come to the UK if you think it's such a foul and racist and horrible nation to live in? But that got me thinking about what purpose you think so-called anti-racism plays today. The reason I'm saying so-called is because I think it's very different to uh, anti-racist campaigning of the past, which was obviously driven by a commitment to equality and justice. But what role do you think it plays? Just going back to comments you made earlier on, do you think it it's more about serving the needs of a largely white middle class who who require that sense of demonstrating their own virtue, demonstrating their own allyship, which really means I'm socially aware. I know what's going on. I'm a good person because I know how downtrodden ethnic minority people are. Do you think it really serves those largely uh, white constituencies of contemporary society far more than it does ethnic minority groups or working class people or any other section of society? Yes, indeed. So I I think a statistic that could be of interest um, and linked to the Rhodes statue was that in 2016, there was a poll asking students from ethnic minorities if they thought the statue had any impact on their study or on their well-being in Oxford. And there was an overwhelming answer of no. So obviously <laughs> they were very happy and uh, feeling privilege to be in an institution that is selective on merit criteria. The trouble is that now this narrative is so deeply ingrained in what people hear all along that I'm not sure the answer to the same poll would be similar nowadays. The trouble is that we are somehow the product of the stories we are told. So being told all along that statues are harmful, that the signs of Western privilege are microaggressions. If you do not come from this culture, all of that is rather damaging. So the trouble is that we don't have any similar narrative for the white people. So that's Mm -hmm. why this anti-racism becomes a bit too racist for my taste. Um, You would never have anyone telling, well, providing white people a narrative saying that they won't make it as a white person. So it remains extremely white and Western-centered because what it doesn't acknowledge is that it is actually very hard for a Westerner to make it in an actually non-white country. There are, There is anti-white racism elsewhere, and that too is something that people do not address because this narrative is still very Western-centered while it claims to be global, while it claims to be open to the situation of other people in the world. So I think the whole purpose of that is to look innocent. Mm. I reckon we are, well, with with this whole very binary way uh, of thinking that is encouraged by social media with this rather Manichaean responses, either well, the, the reactions on, or on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram, it's either I like or I entirely dislike and this should burn in hell. So <laughs> there is no room for complexity anymore. And I guess people are well aware that they're not perfect, but now they have to signal that they are not bad. Yeah. So having to wear a rainbow ribbon to show that one is not against homosexual people, I I find it extremely offensive because, yes, as a starting point, we should not be homophobic. And if someone is, as an individual, then it's the problem of this person and it has to be addressed. And if this person acts in a homophobic way or in a racist way or whatever, this person has to be corrected. But making everyone presumably guilty and forcing everyone to disclose a sign of innocence, I think, in a way, is more a way way of answering the lack of subtleness in thinking that has been happening over the last decade and that we just need to go back to a more nuanced form of discourse. 
Okay, speaking of a lack of subtlety in thinking and thinking and uh, the need for more complexity, I want to ask you about something that is, I think, very unnuanced, which is critical race theory and the notion, well, there are lots of discussions over what critical race theory really is. And in the US in particular, where some parents groups are starting to push back against critical race theory ideas in schools, they're often told, well, you don't understand what critical race theory is. It's more complicated than that. And you haven't been to university. How could you possibly know? And there's a rather uh, patrician pushback against their criticisms. But how do you see critical race theory? How do you understand it? And and how much of a problem do you think it is? Because it strikes me that there are potentially many issues with it. But one of the worst, I think, is the broader issue of how it c- creates a very rigid structure through which we are encouraged to make sense of the entire world, which is the structure of racial thinking. And I just cannot see that in any way as a positive step forward when we are being encouraged to understand our lives and our communities and our world in this hyper-racial way. Well, I'll try to explain critical race theory as far as I understand it. And as you said, well, it is complicated, not because people are not educated and didn't go to university or didn't want to learn about it. It is because it is a sort of umbrella that mm, yeah. encompasses very different perspectives. But I think what they all have in common, uh, and I'm thinking mainly of Ibrahim Kendi here, uh, is that we would have this idea that all the power dynamics nowadays are linked to racial differences and that therefore you would have this idea of the white western being the norm and the rest being abnormal slash bad slash negative mm. so critical race theory would embrace this divide which in my opinion is already rather racist and would try to explain any anything that happens nowadays either an artistic creation, a political situation or whatever, by this divide between the Western white referential and the other side of the world. So in a way, while it presents itself as progressive, critical race theory just perpetuates the cliches of late 19th century of uh, the white is normal and whatever is not white is exotic and fascinating and has to be looked at uh, with a sort of care and cautiousness, but we should not be allowed to talk about it lightly. And I think that's one of the main consequences of uh, the way critical race theory is applied nowadays. It's this difficulty of talking about anything racial. So we hear things about race all the time, but whatever I could say about race would be put under scrutiny because it might be racist in a way or another. So the outcome of it is that uh, on the one hand, you would have educators who would think that children as early as three or four should be socialized in a way that would make them aware that if they are white, they are privileged and they should be extra cautious, not asking their curly haired uh, friend in the classroom why their hair is curly. So I think if we had the opposite thing of a white child in a majoritarily black school, all the kids would be jumping around and thinking, oh, how amazing, you're, how, what, what, how, would, how does it happen that your hair is so straight? How come mm-hmm. you're blonde? So it's, I think that there's, a, well, the fact that this would be taped on the education of children is deeply damaging because it goes against our natural sense of wonder towards what is different. Moreover, it only enforces this idea that difference is bad. So mm-hmm. while it pretends that it acts in the name of equality, it just nurtures the prejudice that there is a norm and whatever does not belong in this norm has to be treated differently. For years, the, the anti-racist discourse was about claiming equality, claiming mm-hmm. fairness, claiming the right not to be judged on one's skin color. And now with critical race theory, we reach something completely different, which is that anyone presenting the slightest slightest racial difference should be treated in a different way. Mm. 
and this is very harmful for young younger people because it prevents them from having a normal socialization that exposes them to difference in a positive way and i think it's also damaging to institutions that would then end up implementing things such as implicit bias training that would presuppose that anyone is deep down inside a racist and that we have to be educated out of our racism to become a slightly less horrible person so i think all of these approaches are all the more paradoxical that they take place in societies that are actually extremely multicultural you would mm. never have um a school program asking um let's say north african kids to be more tolerant towards their french spanish or italian friends who have just landed because it is so hard to be a foreigner or a newcomer it only stems from the fact that in the west there is already an amazing awareness of what it means to have different people around and what it means not to be aggressive so instead of developing all of this in a way that would lead people to feel guilty or to feel bad about themselves um well why wouldn't we just celebrate the fact that europe and the united states have achieved so much over the last century in terms of overcoming their own prejudice in in terms of accepting people with completely different religions cultures languages and all that in a way that no other place in the world has. You're listening to the Brendan O'Neill show. If you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. With most providers like iTunes or Spotify, it's really easy to do with just one click. And if you get this show via YouTube, then make sure you not only subscribe to Spike's YouTube channel, but that you also click the bell so that you are alerted to every new episode. Another thing that worries me about the contemporary discussion on race is the way in which often old racial prejudices are rehabilitated in a kind of politically correct language. And one of the ways in which that's done, I think, and you've kind of hinted at this earlier on, is the the culture of low expectations that is often uh, apparent around people from ethnic minorities. And this is something that I've always found incredibly disturbing. And I speak as someone, my parents come from a, a, a very poor rural part of Ireland, where my father, despite the fact that that's where they come from, my father learned Latin at school. And this was a, you know, very, not a very well stocked or uh, rich school in the West of Ireland. And yet they still learned Latin. And it was seen as a means through which they could be educated out of their conditions. I'm sure there was a paternalistic element to that and a way in which they could be improved as human beings and improved as citizens and, and given a broader understanding of the world beyond the place in which they lived and beyond the things that they did. And increasingly, those the idea that you should teach the classics or that you should teach Greek or Latin or, or any of those other kind of things is increasingly seen as elitist and problematic, and especially problematic if your student is a, a black student or a student from an ethnic minority. And the whole decolonizing the curriculum movement also seems aimed in in, in large part at, at removing certain elitist texts and replacing them with something that people can more readily relate to. And it strikes me that even though this is presented as a, a battle against elitism, it seems to me to be a new form of elitism, which is that well, those people can't really cope with these great, wonderful texts of, of human history, and therefore they should just be left to their own little books and, and they'll be fine. Isn't that just quite racist? I think it is. <laughs> so um, I, you've probably heard about that. I, I think it was a, a school in the United States that decided that forks and knives are racist because it just matches the Western lifestyle and it does not necessarily answer to what pupils from other cultures would know at home. So yes, indeed, there is a culture of, of low expectations uh, when this is transferred to the curriculum and how it should be taught. So 
while some argue about forks and knives, uh, some want to remove arithmetics because, you know, arithmetics are rational and reason is a sort of Western white mm -hmm. cisgender man thing. Mm -hmm. While we all know that black people, women, homosexuals, trans people are irrational, crazy and uncontrollable. So <laughs> you see how this whole mm -hmm. set of cliches reemerges from the darkest, saddest pages of 19th century paternalistic culture. So one thing that is fascinating about children is that they love to learn. They love learning anything about anything. And it's completely normal because our brain gets high on discoveries. And whether a child is presented with a tale from mythology or a documentary about whatever thing happening at the other, other end of the world, the child will want to learn and to discover that and to learn more about it. So deciding that there are things that children should not learn because it would give them an unfair privilege is actually insulting to their reason. It just means that, well, if you happen to be a black child, no, the Latin declensions are too much for your poor black little brain and you should just sit down and play with cubes or whatever until you discover Latin on your own, if you ever do. So the positive point about teaching classics is that in a way, it is not that common anymore to have a family with a very high classical education background. Most of the time, parents who would want their child to learn classics have not actually learned Latin or Greek themselves, mm. but they would just think that it's a good thing because it's, it's a new thing to learn and who wouldn't want their child to learn something? Now, what happens once a child gains this education is that it comes with a whole set of deeper understanding of the Western culture. And there's nothing bad about wanting to understand Western culture. Whether we live here or in India, in China, in South Africa, learning about a culture, whatever it is, is good. So why should we remove this just because it happens to be linked to the West? I think in a way there is a, a huge prejudice against anything white and Western at mm. the moment that is paradoxically enforced by the very people who already benefit from it. Yeah. Yeah. So for instance, well, when, when I see classics teachers thinking that, well, saying that classics are not necess necessary and that it should be all right to remove it altogether from the cur curriculum, I, I find it rather sad because at the same time, you would have teenagers who suddenly discover that they love mythology, who suddenly discover that they love ancient Athens, ancient Rome, and want to learn more about it. So these kids now turn to online teaching to mm. learn Greek and Latin, which in a way is amazing. But why wouldn't we offer the same opportunity for children from different backgrounds to access it? Because the trouble is that if we only rely on individual curiosity, we end up creating much more difference and much more inequality than by providing it um, in, a, in a fair way from the beginning. And just because a child's parents have not taken classics doesn't mean that this child wouldn't like it. I remember well, when I was studying in France, uh, one of my classmates was, well, she, she was the best in Latin and she came from Indian background. Her parents had immigrated in France when she was a child and they saw learning Latin as the best social lift for their children. Learning something about the country where they were settling to them was the best way for their children to actually belong. Just knowing the origins, the history of the place and what happened before and why most of the French words would have Latin roots, etc. It's fascinating in and of itself. And it's also extremely practical. I, when, when I landed in Oxford, I had a, well, 
very bad French accent. My grammar was even worse than it is right now. But the first <laughs> conversations I had with colleagues were about Aristotle and Plato, because that's what we had in common across mm. different disciplines. I, I teach French, but I could talk about that with a law professor or with someone who studies political theory or with someone who teaches science. We all had that background in common. And it was the first way for me to click in and to belong here. And why, why would we deprive anyone from a way to belong? I think that's a very important point about how it is often those sections of society that still benefit from the classics and from access to the greatest art and literature who will be at least complicit in the idea and the argument that those things are not appropriate for poorer sections of society, ethnic minorities and others. So uh, it, it, I find it incredibly frustrating that often those who went to private school and who's, who still take their kids to a museum on a on a Saturday afternoon and who will still go to the opera once a month are very often the people who who uh, implicitly or explicitly push the argument that the right thing to do by ethnic minority people these days is to give them things that they can find accessible. And I just think that's such a betrayal off the great humanist traditions and the right of all members of society to have access to those traditions. So my final question for you, Marie, is on, on that issue itself. One of my favorite thinkers is uh, C.L.R. James, and who he famously said that he was a, an implacable opponent of European colonialism, but an unwavering admirer of the gains of Western civilization and the wonders of Western civilization. And you've mentioned already that being against the West and being critical of the West and thinking that the West is just singularly bad is, is quite on trend at the moment. And I wonder, just to finish, how do you think we can explain to people the difference between the fact that Western countries did questionable and bad things in the past? No one would deny that, I'm sure. But just to distinguish between that and the fact that there are wonders in, in the Western canon, the Western traditions, uh, the Western Enlightenment, and other Enlightenments around the world too, that it's really important that we hold on to and that we communicate to the next generation. Well, I guess the most important thing you said is things that have to be communicated to the next generation. A definition of culture that I really like is from the French philosopher Rémi Braque. So he defines culture as the set of norms that ensure the continuity of a said society. So these cultural norms, I know everyone hates the word norms at the <laughs> moment, but appreciating something, thinking that something is valuable, makes us able to understand it somehow. So it it's not necessarily the other way around. So uh, the way that we judge the Western civilization nowadays is rather unfair because, well, as you said, it did bring a lot to the world. If you compare it, let's say, to other fallen empires, I think we owe globally a lot more to the French and the British Empire than to the Ottoman Empire or to the different empires that have um, ruled over North Africa. Not to say that empires are good or that whatever they did was good, but that a civilization that has some sort of political stability will also have the time to develop art and culture in a way that others would not. So as a result, it gives a set of beautiful things that anyone can learn to appreciate. What I find uh, fascinating is that not to say that other cultures are well don't have a very valid, very interesting set of cultural characters, etc. It's just that here we're living in Great Britain at the time we do, there is nothing bad in being able to quote Shakespeare or to make jokes about Byron or whatever. It just helps us belong together by having shared references. These are extremely important not only talking between us, but also for the connection from one generation to the other. Classics are what helps us help us 
talk to our grandparents and they might be what help us communicate to our grandchildren as well. So it might look boring, tedious, dusty, whatever. There comes a time in life when we realize that we speak through a set of references and that if we destroy all of this, we destroy our ab ability to share the space we live in together. Marie, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.